Our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the most misunderstood messenger of God. A life that is filled with challenges, with the struggles, and with success. Please join me in 30 episodes to discuss the life and the legacy of our great prophet. I am your brother, Mustafa Bazwi. Salaamu Alaikum. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين In the name of Allah, the most merciful, the most compassionate May his peace and blessings be upon all of his messengers and prophets And upon the seal of the messengers Muhammad صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم and his family and his righteous companions and upon his ummah and his nation and his followers and upon you my dear brothers and sisters assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh bara'atun min allah wa rasulihi ila alladhina ahadtum min al mushrikeen فسيحوا في الأرض أربعة أشهر واعلموا أنكم غير معجز الله وأن الله مخز الكافرين وأذان من الله ورسوله إلى الناس يوم الحج الأكبر أن الله بريء من المشركين ورسوله فإن تبتم فإن تبتم فهو خير لكم وَإِنْ تَوَلَّيْتُمْ فَاعْلَمُوا أَنَّكُمْ غَيْرُ مُعْجِزِ اللَّهِ وَبَشِّرَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِعَذَابٍ أَلِيمٍ Surat Bara'ah is chapter number 9 in the Holy Quran. And some people call it At-Tawbah. And this chapter is considered, according to many, as being probably the most controversial chapter in the Quran by many non-Muslims and many analysts, many theologians, many orientalists, many professors of Islamic studies. And usually this chapter is misquoted in the discussions that involves Islam and the role of Islam and the role of Sharia nowadays in the West. This chapter has to be studied very carefully. We have to understand these verses within its own historical contexts, not to get them out of these historical contexts. So what is the story of this chapter, chapter number nine? And why God says bara'atun, repudiation of the non-believers why God is saying that we are, bara'a means we are free of any obligation. We are dissociated from you. We have no any obligation towards you. So what happened? Especially the first four verses of this chapter, Surah Bara'a, very controversial. So let's shed some light on what happened and the background of this story. The story goes back to the time of the age of ignorance before Islam, where it was the tradition of some Arabs that to come and circumambulate the house of God without clothing, being naked. 
And some of them, they would clap hands. Some of them, they would whistle. وَمَا كَانَ صَلَاتُهُمْ عِنْدَ الْبَيْتِ عِنْدَ الْبَيْتِ إِلَّا مُكَاءً وَتَصْدِيَ Their supplication and their prayers was nothing but clapping and whistling. So when the Prophet in the eighth year after his migration, he entered the city of Mecca during what is being known as the conquest of Mecca, he did not prevent or stop the polytheist from coming to Mecca for pilgrimage. It was still a free zone, open for all to come. So even after Mecca converting to Islam, or let's say reverting to monotheism, because it was a monotheistic city and community in the beginning, when Ibrahim, peace be upon him, with his son Ismail, they built the house. So it was the center of monotheism. But over the time, people brought some idols and they turned the city into the center of polytheism. So people would come still after Fath Mecca and the conquest of Mecca, and they would still do their pilgrimage. And some of them would still do the circumambulation, the tawaf, while they are naked. And history tells us that there was a lady, Arab lady, who came and she wanted to do the tawaf. And the tradition was when you do the tawaf with your clothing, once you finish your tawaf around the house, you have to donate your clothing to the charity, to the poor people. You cannot keep wearing them. So they said to her, remember when you finish your tawaf, you have to donate your clothing. She said, but I don't have any other. And I cannot afford to buy another set of clothing. So in order for her tawaf to be accepted, she did the tawaf with no clothing on her. And it was, uh, something that has been recorded, spectacular scene that has been recorded in the history of the Arabs and the history of Islam. She was doing the tawaf and at the same time she would say, oh, people do not look at me. I don't give permission to anyone to, you know, to watch me. So this created some chaos there. And the Prophet was not comfortable with this. Neither Allah was comfortable with it, nor the community of the believers. Because this is some sort of, you know, uh, disrespect, if you will, and violation of the sanctity of the Holy House. Therefore, the Quran came with Surat Bara'a or Tawbah, especially the first four verses of them in the year nine after the Hijrah, declaring that we have no connection anymore with the polytheist and they should not come to the Holy Mosque. One of the reasons, not all the reasons, but one of them is to stop this habit of circumambulation being naked around the house, to stop it, to put an end to it. As a respect, وَطَحِّرَ بَيْتِي Purify my house, purify it from all these, you know, scenes and all these things that takes place, that take place and they are not appropriate, they are not good, they are not worthy of the house of God. So this was one of the reasons, not the entire reason. So the, the ayah come, comes and says, min Allahi wa This is an announcement of the annulment. Annulment of 
a treaty or a truce between the Prophet and the idolaters. Bara'atum min Allahi wa rasulihi ila alladheena ahadtum min al mushrikeen. So we give you some time to prepare yourself for this ban. It's not immediate. We give you some time to prepare yourself psychologically, physically too, so you don't come anymore within four months. And these four months, it was part of it in Dhul Hijjah, Muharram, Safar, Rabi' al Awwal. We give you some time so you don't come anymore. You know that this would be now a zone where only the believers would come to it and those who respect the sanctity of the house. And the Prophet asked Abu Bakr, because he had many friends with the non-believers, to go and lead the Hajj that year, year nine. Why the Prophet did not go himself? Because the Prophet was told that the non-believers and the pagans, they still come and they do the tawaf naked. So the Prophet said, I'm not going to go on. So I don't see, I don't look at these scenes. I don't like them. I don't like even this environment of disrespect. So I would stay away. So he did not go for that reason until the house becomes completely purified and then he would go. So he sent Abu Bakr as the emir of the Hajj season of the pilgrims and uh, to deliver this message. And he said to him, you deliver it Yawmun Nahr, the day of sacrifice, which is of course the day of Eid, Eid al-Adha. Stand there where the non-believers, they would they can hear you and deliver the message of God to them that from now on no naked people should be allowed to circumambulate around the house and also that uh, that other, uh, that non-believers would not would, would not given would not be given per permission to come into the house so Abu Bakr took the book, the letter, and he took off from Medina, going to Mecca. When he reached uh, halfway through an, an area called Ar-Rawha, Gabriel descended upon the Prophet saying, Ya Rasulullah, لا يؤدي عنك إلا أنت أو رجل منك. This message has to be delivered either by you or by someone from your own family who's related to you. So the Prophet asked Imam Ali to go and tell Abu Bakr to give him the book and ask Abu Bakr to come back to Medina. So Imam Ali took off to the road, the highway between Medina and Mecca and he was able to reach Abu Bakr while he was in this location al Rawha, and he conveyed to him the request of the Prophet and he took the book from him and he continued his journey to Mecca while Abu Bakr retreated back to Medina but he was worried so he came to the Prophet he said Ya Rasulallah Anzadallah fiya shay'a God is criticizing me or saying something against me the Prophet said, no, God says, either I deliver it or someone of me to deliver this. So Imam Ali went there to the Hajj season and then he delivered this message on the day of Eid. Delivered the message that لا يحج بعد هذا العام مشرك ولا يطوف بالبيت عريان. Number one, after this Hajj, this is the last Hajj season where non-believers can participate. From now on, non-believers cannot come to pilgrimage. Number two, no naked person can circumambulate this house or enter this mosque. 
And of course, there are many other clauses within that declaration. Now, there is an important question here that we must listen to it when we are asked. Many people who happen to not to subscribe to Islam, and many Muslims too, who subscribe to Islam, they ask, then why do you prevent people from going to the house of God? And why do you break this covenant with the non-believers? And the answer is that the house of God has a sanctity. Today, temples, even those that belong to other religions, to the Mormons, to the Catholics, to the Jews, Jehovah Witnesses, to the Buddhists, to the Hindus, these are places of worship, sacred to the followers of these religions. So it has to be respected. It has to be maintained, not just physically, but morally and ethically and spiritually too. So this is one reason. The second reason why the Prophet is disconnecting his accord and he is declaring the annulment of the peace treaty and the truce between him and polytheist is because they broke that truce. The Prophet signed this truce in the sixth year, three years earlier, three years before this ban came. The ban came in the year nine. The truce was signed in the year six. Within these three years, Quraysh and their allies and the polytheists in the Arabian Peninsula did not respect the spirit of this treaty or this peace truce. They violated many times. They attacked many, many tribes that they were the allies of the Prophet. They killed members of them. So they did not respect this treaty. They committed many violations and the Prophet was patient. And God says to the Prophet, when you sign a treaty, if the other side breaks it, you may give them some time to come back. But, they, but if they keep breaking it, then you should not keep that treaty anymore. And this is in the Holy Quran. This is in the Holy Quran in Surah Al-Anfal, chapter 8, verse 50, 58. وَإِمَّا تَخَافَنَّ مِنْ قَوْمٍ خِيَانَةً If you fear from some communities an act of treachery and breaking and violate, uh, violation of the treaty فَنْبِذْ إِلَيْهِمْ عَلَى سَوَى Treat them in an equal way. Do the same with them. For God does not like, does not respect the treacherous. So do the same. If they break the treaty, you have to break it too. Then this treaty has no value. Treaties and peace accords have values when they are uphold, when they are respected. But if the other side keeps breaking them and disrespecting them, and throwing them behind his back, then you should not humiliate yourself. You should not dis disrespect yourself. Otherwise, this would be considered a sign of weakness. And you must not do that. This is the second reason. The third reason why we had this declaration, Bara'a, repudiating the non-believers and the announcement, the declaration that there is no more peace treaty between you and us, and then there is a ban on non-believers 
shutting them off from coming to Mecca because of their violations, because of their threats. You would not shut off people if they are peaceful, if they have good intention. But one, the vast majority of certain people, certain community, in this case, the polytheist, they come and they violate your rules, they disrespect, they don't play by the book, they don't follow the rules, they don't follow the law of the land, then you would feel threatened and you must do something about it, right? God is saying to the prophet that even when they signed the peace treaty with you, they signed it out of, out of force and coercion because they had no choice, out of desperation, not because they believed in peace, not because they wanted peace to prevail, but because they had no choice. The day they had choice, they were fighting you all the time and chasing you, non-stop. Journey after journey and trip after trip and expedition after expedition and war after war and a battle after, it was continuous. Their persecution, their harassment, their torture, their bloodshed never stopped. But the day you gained some strength, now they recognize you as a reckoning fo force. Now they recognize you as an important force. So their peace treaty was not genuine. And God says to him, if, if they are able to attack, definitely they will attack. Definitely they will attack. Because we can see them always gathering weapons and forces and plots one after the other. And their goal is to annihilate this community of the believers. So God says in chapter 9, Surah At-Tawbah, كَيْفَ وَإِنْ يَظْهَرُوا عَلَيْكُمْ لَا يَرْقُبُوا فِيكُمْ إِلَّا وَلَا ذِمَّةٍ If they, one day they prevail over you, they would never observe any kinship between you and them. Even if you are their relatives, they would murder you. Or treaty, وَلَا ذِمَّةٍ They would not respect any treaty. But because they are weak today, they are weak they can't do anything about it. This is why do not, you should not respect the peace treaty with them because it does not no, no longer exist. It no longer exists. Doesn't exist anymore because of their violation. Practically, they throw it away. However, Quran says with those who respect their treaties with you, you also must respect your treaty or treaties with them too. You must not violate that. Quran says that, and this is again, because you need to know where, where is this in the Quran. This is in Surah At-Tawbah. You don't break your treaty, your peace treaty with them. They did not break the treaty with you. Again, this is in Surah At-Tawbah. If you read from verse number one until verse number 10. ثم لم ينقضوكم شيئا ولم يظاهروا عليكم. They are peaceful. They are polytheist. They don't want to believe in God. It's okay. This is their personal choice. You can't force them. But neither they break the treaties with you, nor they provoke and incite military actions against you. وَلَمْ يُظَاهِرُوا عَلَيْكُمْ أَحَدًا فَأَتِمُّوا إِلَيْهِمْ أَحْدَهُمْ Fulfill, fulfill the treaty and the peace accord with them. Respect it. And some of them, uh, Umayya ibn Safwan, Sahl ibn Umayr, those people were uh, polytheists. 
non-believers, but they still stayed in Mecca. Nobody asked them to leave because they were peaceful. They were peaceful. They did not turn against the Prophet. Neither they plotted against the Prophet. They stayed there. So basically the Quran is saying here, if the polytheist respect the treaties and the truce between you and them, you must also respect that. You must never violate that and never attack them and never harass them. Leave them alone. They are citizens of the country, the community, the land, even though they differ with you in their ideology, let it be. This is a freedom of choice. We are not fighting people because they are not like us in religion. If you fight, you fight to defend yourself. If you fight some people, you are fighting them to protect yourself, not because they are not like you. Quran says, very powerful in chapter 76. We have showed him the way. Whether he wants to be a believer or non-believer, it's up to you. It's up to you. God is not going to force you. Because there is no worth and no value of forcing people to believe in God. You know what will happen? You will create a community of hypocrites, not genuine believers. Leave them alone. God wants you to reach to him through conviction, through reason, through freedom, through free will, not coercion or force. So God says those who respect the treaties, you respect them, leave them alone. Those who break it, they have no room in the society because they are ultimately, you know, potentially they are a source of threat, a source of agitation, and, and the source of war and casualties. And you don't need more wars and casualties. This is the bara'a, the declaration of bara'a, meaning the disconnection, dissociation, and the end of the peace treaty with the non-believers in Mecca on the ninth year after the hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.